Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's virtual public program, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, with Martha S. Jones in conversation with Manisha Sinha. The American Antiquarian Society is located on the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community, who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper, president of the society. Our mission is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past, grounded in the primary sources AAS has been collecting since 1812. In addition to welcoming researchers from around the world to use our collections, physical and digital, we host programs like tonight's that provide insights into the past and its resonance for our own day. We thank you for joining us this evening. And as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support you can provide to help keep this work going. Thank you. My colleague, Amanda Kondek, will be sharing a few notes on how to comment and ask questions in the Zoom Q&A. Amanda will also post links and relevant information in the chat throughout the program. This program is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube page following the live stream. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Manisha Sinha, who will moderate tonight's conversation. Dr. Sinha holds the Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut. She was also the Mellon Distinguished Scholar in Residence here at AAS in 2020, 2021. And in 2022, she was awarded a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. She currently serves on the AAS Council, our governing board. Dr. Sinha is the author of The Counter-Revolution of Slavery, Politics and Ideology in Antebellum, South Carolina, and most recently, The Slave's Cause, A History of Abolition, which was long listed for the National Book Award for Nonfiction and won the 2017 Frederick Douglass Prize for the best book on the history of slavery and abolition, as well as multiple other awards. A historian of the long 19th century, her research interests lie specifically in the transnational histories of slavery, ab abolition, and feminism, and the legacy and history of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And now I will turn it over to Manisha Sinha to introduce our speaker and tonight's conversation. Manisha, over to you. Thank you, Scott, for that generous introduction. Uh, and I'm delighted to uh, introduce our speaker for the evening today. Uh, Martha S. Jones is a historian, writer, and commentator who focuses on how Black Americans have shaped the history of American democracy. She is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. She is an immediate past co-president of the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians, and today serves on the boards and committees of the Society of American Historians, the Library of Congress, the National Women's History Museum, the US Capitol Historical Society, the Johns Hopkins University Press, the CUNY Law School Foundation, the Journal of African American History and Slavery and Abolition. Jones was elected to the AAS membership in 2018. Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, which she will be talking about today, was the winner of the 2021 LA Times Book Prize for History, the finalist for the 2021 Mark Linton History Prize, a 2021 Museum of African American History Stone Book Award shortlist selection, a 2021 Kundal History Prize shortlist selection, and named a best book for 2020 by Ms. Time, Foreign Affairs, Black Perspectives, The Undefeated, and Smithsonian. So on a personal note, I will add that I got to know Martha while co-editing a fresh riff with my friend Penny Wan Eschen, for our mutual mentor, Eric Foda, Martha contributed a wonderful essay on the everyday freedom claims of Black Baltimoreans in the court for that volume. So without further ado, Martha, the floor is all yours. 
Well, good evening. Um, thank you, Scott. Um, and I especially thank you, uh, Manisha. Um, you're too modest um, when you mention the essay I wrote under your direction, because of course, that was the kernel um, for my second book, uh, Birthright Citizens. Um, so um, it's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, I'm gonna talk for a bit um, and share uh, one of the culminating uh, moments um, in the story of Vanguard, which really spans um, almost two centuries. Um, I wanna talk about what happens around 1920 in the 19th Amendment for African-American women, but I know then um, I will have a chance to talk with Manisha and um, whatever questions she might have will be wonderful, but perhaps we'll get to talk about some of the early history. Um, there's also a part of this book and a, a, a field um, that we both share. So again, thanks very much for being here in a week where African-American history, African-American studies um, has been much in the news and uh, much unsettled um, by political events. Um, it's really an honor to be at the American Antiquarian Society and have a conversation with you all about um, wonderful history. Now, some of you may remember that in 2020, we marked the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, um, the so-called Women's Suffrage Amendment. Um, one of um, my reflections um, as this book, Vanguard, came to press um, was that I really didn't much have the mood for celebration. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I really had just finished a book about the history of Black women in the vote. Um, I am as interested in anyone um, uh, in an anniversary of this sort and its significance to the nation's past. Uh, but it was also true that um, while there was a great deal of celebration that went on, um, I knew that the history I had to tell um, offered a perspective um, that really uh, required perhaps more contemplation and more reflection and less celebration. When we appreciate how in 1920, Black women's disenfranchisement in the United States was an open secret the facts of the 19th Amendment, I think, fit only awkwardly with events that featured, as many of you experienced, light shows and period costumes and marching bands. In 1920, members of Congress who promulgated the 19th Amendment, state lawmakers who ratified it, and suffragists themselves all understood that nothing in the amendment's terms would prohibit individual states from deliberately, strategically using poll taxes, literacy tests, understanding clauses to keep black women from registering to vote nonetheless. Nothing in the new amendment promised to curb the intimidation and the violence that threatened black women who were readying to come out to polling places. Voting rights and voter suppression went hand in hand in 1920. Now, for me, when we look at this moment in August 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified, um, two myths, I think, predominate. The first is that it goes something like when the 19th Amendment became law, all American women won the vote. You might even hear people say American women were guaranteed the vote after 1920. Uh, but there's a second myth that is almost a inverse of the first. Um, and that goes, um, no black women gained the vote in 1920, that racism kept black women from the polls. And so um, our conversation tonight um, is in part a confrontation with those myths, um, confronting it with good history. Um, and of course, neither one of those broad generalizations hold true. So let's take a look first at what happens in August of 1920 when the US Secretary of State certified the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. It had been ratified by the required 36 states. Another week and it became the law of the land. And I can read the uh, germane part of the amendment because it's a short one, but its language is instructive for us as we think through this puzzle about what happened and what didn't happen in 1920. It goes, 
the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So what precisely did this mean for American women? It was true with the 19th Amendment, laws that had reserved the ballot for men now violated the Constitution. Still, the 19th Amendment, as I think you hear in the language, did not promise women the vote. Still, laws, state laws, kept women from the polls based on age, citizenship, residency, mental competence, and more. It was still true in 1920 that women who were U.S. citizens, who married non-citizens, were denationalized, lost their citizenship, and hence their right to vote. So in 1920, as the fall arrives, American women still face hurdles getting to the polls, even if sex was no longer one of them. Of course, in our conversation, there was one additional barrier to women's votes that persisted even after the federal amendment, and that was anti-Black racism. It was true that the 15th Amendment in 1870, 50 years earlier, had expressly forbid states from denying the vote because of race. But by 1920, everyone knew how lawmakers in the South and in some places in the West had set in place hurdles that while silent in large part on their face about race, were designed to have the net effect of disenfranchising Black Americans. Those poll taxes, literacy tests, grand grandfather clauses had effectively kept many Black men from casting ballots since the 1890s. Unchecked intimidation and the threat of lynching had sealed that deal. Local voting officials had effectively constructed in many places a color line, even if they didn't expressly invoke race. So did American women win the vote in 1920? Well, not all women. African-American women in too many states became merely equals to their fathers and their husbands. State laws disenfranchised them too in an end run around the spirits of the 15th and 19th amendments. When we look as registration numbers for this period, as best we can, um, we see the effects of discriminatory laws. In the fall of 1920, Black women presented themselves to voting officials, but many found that the books were indeed closed. And still, the very first waves of Black women voters had been unleashed years before, before 1920, as individual states made women's suffrage the law. Importantly, in California starting in 1911, Illinois in 1913, and New York in 1917, Black women were already experienced voters by 1920. Some even managed to register and cast ballots in the fall of 1920 in the wake of the 19th Amendment. How did they do that? One example comes from the city of St. Louis in Missouri, where Black women in anticipation of the 19th Amendment are organized in suffrage schools. Here, um, they are um, educating one another in how to pay a poll tax, how to pass a literacy test, how to remain undeterred um, when facing down begrudging officials. In a city like St. Louis, black women and white women that these news accounts tell us, turned out so much so in 1920 that nearly every woman in the city was registered to vote in that season, black and white. But when we dig into their stories, we appreciate that even as black and white women come to the polls in St. Louis, they do so out of overlapping, but also distinct motivations. Now for all women, the fall of 1920, casting those first ballots is indeed an actualization, a realization of some of the promise of the 19th Amendment. Women now joining members of the body politic, exercising the franchise, having a role in making the laws. Um, black and white women alike are stepping into this new uh, 
um, season, this new chapter in American women's political lives. But for African-American women, there is a particular set of measures on the ballot that bring them out in those droves. And that is the rise of Jim Crow segregation in the city of St. Louis. What black women know in St. Louis is that since 1916, local officials have been using ballot referenda to set in place new and deeply discriminatory housing segregation rules. And black women come out to defeat or to attempt to defeat these new Jim Crow measures. And so we see the ways in which Black women's political identities, their political motivations, the meaning of the 19th Amendment for them lives right at that intersection of both the realization of their rights as women um, and their ongoing struggles over their rights as Black Americans. But contrast the story of uh, St. Louis, Missouri, to that of Daytona in Florida, where the educator and National Association of Colored Women's Club leader, Mary McLeod Bethune, was traveling the state of Florida in 1920, encouraging Black women to organize, to register, to come out and cast their ballots that fall. Mrs. Bethune, like many Black voting rights organizers in 1920 is confronted by brutal, brutal opposition, organized opposition um, led by the Ku Klux Klan. Um, there will be, yes, intimidation. Yes, there will be lynching. There will be bombings. Um, and Mrs. Bethune um, is visited. Um, on the eve of election day in 1920 by white robed Klansmen who gather in downtown Daytona and then march to the ground of her then girls school, uh, what is today Bethune-Cookman University in Daytona. The Klan marches to Mrs. Bethune's school in an effort to intimidate her, intimidate her faculty and to intimidate the Black women of Daytona who are organized to come to the polls the next day. Now, the Klan doesn't succeed in 1920, and Black women work together. They turn out to the polls en masse to take advantage of what protection there is in numbers, and they do cast their ballots even as they face um, discouragement, even from voting officials. But by 1922, 1923, even Mrs. Bethune um, will have abandoned um, this direct action approach to voting rights in Florida. Um, the Klan persists and it becomes much too dangerous and black women along with black men in Florida are widely disenfranchised by the early 1920s. Um, so when black women in the fall, November, December of 1920, look out across the national landscape and assess the force of the 19th amendment in their political lives, uh, they see um, a patchwork landscape. Um, women in cities like Chicago, um, St. Louis and Missouri, New York um, are indeed casting ballots um, and beginning to exact their force at the polls, especially in local contests. But in too many other places like Daytona, Florida, they have been brutalized, intimidated, and in many cases disenfranchised. And the question is, what to do next? Part of the charge for answering that question falls on the short shoulders of an educator from Ohio um, Hallie Quinn Brown. Hallie Quinn Brown in 1920 is president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And these, this state of affairs, the ongoing disenfranchisement of Black women is hardly lost on, Callie, on Hallie Quinn Brown. She understands that 
um, now black women need to develop a new strategy, a new approach, a new campaign that will actually give teeth to the promise of the 15th and 19th amendments. And uh, black women uh, associated with the club movement uh, will organize um, so much so that by the beginning of 1921, um, they are prepared to execute on a campaign, a campaign now aimed at winning federal legislation that would give teeth to these amendments, that would override the state laws that would curb the violence and intimidation and fully restore black voting rights across the country. Federal legislation, how to achieve this. One view is that um, black women might join forces very deliberately with white suffragists whom they must admire in one sense because um, white women had succeeded in winning a 19th amendment that had served their political interest, that had furthered their political interest and had gotten them largely unbridled access to the polls. And in fact, um, this is an important enough uh, vision for an ongoing movement for women's voting rights um, that a contingent of black women activists will attend the meeting in February of 1921 of the National Women's Party. Um, here, um, they are looking to call on Alice Paul, um, the radical suffragist who had been so responsible for bringing the president, bringing Congress to the table on voting rights and ultimately winning the 19th amendment. These are women who believe that if they can join forces with Paul, they can continue the job and win this federal legislation. And they call on Paul. And we know too little about what's said behind closed doors between these women, um, but we do know uh, what happens next. Um, Alice Paul, um, rather than joining forces um, with black club women in 1921, um, will begin to fold up the National Women's Party, will deem that chapter in her work done, um, and very soon thereafter will begin a new campaign for a second federal amendment, um, a federal amendment that is still seems making its way toward ratification and equal rights amendment. Um, but women like Hallie Quinn Brown and her contingent of club women are really left now to build a campaign on their own to win black women's voting rights. The story of what follows, um, some of that is part of fable. Um, but I wanna remind us that it takes a three pronged campaign and another half century for black women to fully win voting rights in the United States with the 1965 adoption of the Voting Rights Act. How do we get there? Three paths, companion paths. Um, one is a legal campaign, um, largely led by the NAACP and including um, great litigators like Thurgood Marshall and Judge Constance Baker Motley um, that legal campaign will use the U.S. Constitution to chip away at the Jim Crow barriers to Black voting rights, challenging uh, grandfather clauses, um, successfully challenging whites-only primaries, um, and even winning um, an amendment to the Constitution um, that would outlaw uh, poll taxes. And so this legal campaign is one of the places where black women focus their energies um, and their support. Um, but the legal campaign um, is not enough. Um, uh, we also need um, women to get into the trenches in every election cycle. And black women will indeed, out of 1920 going forward, when they can, where they can, register to vote, cast ballots, use their voting power strategically to move the needle on election day. Probably best remembered for this facet of the ongoing movement um, is the work 
um, organized in part by Ida B. Wells in the city of Chicago, where black women have been voting since 1913, um, where black women by the 1920s are not only registered voters, they are Republican party operatives. Um, they are strategically voting as a block out of Chicago um, to affect local elections. And indeed in 1928 to help elect the first black member of Congress since the rise of Jim Crow, Oscar de Priest to the House of Representatives in 1928. So it is necessary to continue where these women can, as they can, to do that season in, season out work of getting to the polls and using strategically their voting power. But of course, um, by the 1930s and surely by the 1940s, um, we all know the story of the rise of the modern civil rights movement. And now black women, um, not merely club women, um, now black women, not merely those with access to the polls um, or to legal strategies, um, but now black women are going to be the foot soldiers, um, the architects, um, the leaders, um, the great minds of a movement that is going to use direct action to hold the feet of the president, hold the feet of Congress, really to hold the feet of the nation to the fire of black voting rights um, and take us all the way through to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, in the summer of uh, 2020, so 100 years, nearly to the day, since ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, I was like a lot of Americans, um, perched on the edge of my uh, sofa with my television on, um, mm -hmm. watching history in the making. Um, then uh, uh, California Senator Kamala Harris um, was slated to accept the Democratic Party's nomination. She was going to run for vice president alongside Joe Biden. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I was going to tune in just to see history being made. Um, but I also wanted to hear what Kamala Harris would tell us about who she was how she came to be there and how she saw herself in history. What I knew from my research for Vanguard was that in nearly every generation, as black women have taken to the pages of newspapers, as they have taken to the podium, as they have taken to the radio waves, to the cameras, to the internets and the blogs and more, as they enter political culture, um, they necessarily tell us stories about the histories that bring them to that moment, helping to make themselves discernible, legible, and part of the fabric of the American story of the body politic. And Kamala Harris didn't hesitate. Um, if you remember, you probably recall, she pays a tremendous homage to her own mother, um, an immigrant to the United States from India, um, a researcher, a, a woman who raised her daughters to know no limits about their ambition and their possibilities. Um, as Harris put it, she stood on the shoulders of her mother. And then she went on to pay tribute to the women of Vanguard, um, six of them. And when I'm talking with young people, this is the quiz part of the evening. Now we're on Zoom and you all are at leisure at home. And so there's no quiz tonight. Um, but I do want to share with you the names that now Vice President Harris invoked as she described the political history, the shoulders upon which she stood. And part of what I want you to hear is while there were many luminaries she might have invoked, Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Alice Paul, she gave us the name of six black women who across this long story of the campaign for the 19th amendment 
and beyond were some of the nation's unforgettable political leaders. And these are the names. You can quiz yourself if you'd like. Um, Mary Church Terrell, Mary McLeod Bethune, who I've mentioned, Diane Nash, Fannie Lou Hamer, Constance Baker Motley, and Shirley Chisholm. Here, Kamala Harris not only tells us something about her own personal journey as a political leader, she tells us something about a new, um, well, maybe not new, um, but often overlooked chapter in our political history. One that her presence, um, her candidacy, now her occupancy of the office of vice president, um, I think insists that um, each and every American attend to, um, to understand um, more fully, more completely, um, more insightfully, in fact, um, who black women are um, in American politics. Now, Harris um, is an example, um, but the last thought I'll leave you with is that in the fall of 1920, as she runs for vice president, she is no longer uh, simply someone who is uh, breaking barriers, though she certainly is doing that. Um, she is not um, simply an exceptional um, figure any longer. Um, Kamala Harris will run on tickets that include um, more than 50 Black women running for Congress alone in 2020. Um, will include uh, Black women who are um, operatives, communication specialists, um, campaign strategists, and more behind the scenes um, in both sides during the 2020 election cycle. And then, of course, there will be those Black women organizers and the foot soldiers that they galvanize um, to make a difference in the outcome of very close contests in states like Georgia. So when we remember Kamala Harris, um, I hope we also remember these six women on whose shoulders she stands and they remind us um, how black women um, here in 2023 um, are today a force in American politics, um, not only firsts. Um, and the question I think that we um, confront today is will we let black women lead? Will we let them be out in front? Will we let them bring the lessons of this long struggle for voting rights, um, for political power? Will we let them bring those lessons um, to our political culture uh, day in and uh, day out? Um, and so I think with that, um, I'll say thank you very much um, for coming out. And I see uh, Manisha Sinha has rejoined me. Thanks so much again, Manisha, for doing this with me this evening. And I'm so glad we have a chance to talk. Thank you, Martha. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, I, I just love the way that you walked us through this long history of Black women's activism that you have read it so beautifully in, in your book, Vanguard. And, um, you know, my first question to you uh, was somewhat answered already in your presentation, and that was your motivation to write this book. And I thought you began by telling us about this important anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And I, uh, you know, love the way in which you give us this complex, nuanced history of that amendment and what it meant uh, to African-American women. Um, so I know that that was part of the motivation. Um, I also know that you wrote another wonderful book, uh, uh, All Bound Up Together, uh, The Woman Question in African-American Political Culture that I have found really useful while writing this new book on, on Reconstruction. So you had a history of, of doing this important work. Um, 
But I want you to talk a little bit about your personal motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it it comes out so beautifully in this book and also in in pieces that you've written elsewhere. And I'm sure our audiences would would our audience today would love to hear about that story because that was so poignant and 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 again beautifully rendered in the book. Well, thank you for that. Um, and what uh, Minji Sinha is, I think, alluding to is um, where this book begins, which is um, at a look um, at my own family history. Um, I uh, knew uh, women in my own family had lived through this the saga right, of, of Vanguard. Um, but it turned out I really knew too little about really where they had been. And so um, I now can confess it, but it was a secret at the time. I took a little detour um, while I was supposed to be finishing the book um, to really try and work the archives and see if I couldn't find my own grandmother, my own great grandmother. And I do indeed find my great grandmother in St. Louis. She's a suffragist at the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA running one of these suffrage clubs. Um, But I also wanted to find my own grandmother who I had known and and who I had grown up with. And that was tougher. Um, But I'll tell you, so in the, by the time I finished the book, I haven't found much about her. Um, I find an interview with her though, that one that she does um, in the 1970s with historian Bill Chafe at Duke University. Chafe is writing uh, a history of civil rights in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is where my grandmother spent most of her adult life. And he interviewed her. And here's the thing. Yes, she does talk about voting rights, but not about 1920. She talks about the modern civil rights era and how thrilling it was um, to work with young women in her community on Operation Door Knock, which in Greensboro got black voters registered, got them to the polls beginning in the 1950s, even before the Voting Rights Act. Um, So this for me was thrilling, but I will tell you um, because time has passed and my quest for this story has not been Satisfied, you know, has not been ended even as the book has ended. There's there's something to know about how we work. The, our questions don't end just because we put the book between covers and it sits on the shelf. Um, so two things happened. One is um, my sister said to me after the book came out, she said, "You know, you're really the family historian. I, I'm gonna. I have a bunch of papers. I don't know what they are. I'm gonna send them to you." And sure enough, I opened the envelope and there is my grandmother's voter registration form um, among these sort of random documents that my sister had kept. And then very recently, um, another historian uh, writing about St. Louis in these years remembered my grandmother um, and her work with the League of Women Voters um, in the 20s in St. Louis. So um, I share that in the detail to say, Um, Part of what I hoped the book would do is get us to ask those questions in our own families, um, to write those stories down, because I sure wish I had asked those questions back when my grandmother was here. Um, I'm left just to work the archives. Um, But we have these opportunities, many of us, to collect those stories and to ask our elders, our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, and more, you know, where were you in these extraordinary moments? Because they really are worth making that record a part of history. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a wonderful story, you know, about uh, your family. And um, I mean, it really shows how this book is, is a labor of love and, and it, it shines through in many ways. Um, so, you know, in just in terms of, the parameters of the book. It's an ambitious book because it goes right back to the 19th century and brings us down to, you know, present day current politics. And um, I like the way you begin with my favorite people, right? (laughs) Which I write a little bit about also in The Slave's Cause. And these are these wonderful uh, Black abolitionist feminists like Sarah Maps Douglas, 
uh, Maria Stewart, the Fortin sisters, there's so many of them. Um, and I was really delighted to see how you began your story with them. And my question for you there is, you know, you begin actually with the figure of Joanna Lee, mm-hmm. who is a preacher. And, um, you know, uh, what William Andrews calls, you know, one of the authors of one of those spiritual narratives, but also somebody who who sermonized, spoke out, um, and, and did a lot of public work that, you know, some of these early Black women preachers did, including Sojourner Truth, who is probably the most famous uh, of them. Um, and I just wanted you to talk a little bit about Joretta Lee. You know, why did you begin with her in particular? What is it about her? and her life story that appealed to you so much? Yeah. You know, one of the challenges I think about bringing Black women fully into the history of this long story of women's political rights, including voting rights, is that, as you know, there are, as best we know, no Black women at Seneca Falls in 1848. So any story that begins with or features Seneca Falls has almost by definition left Black women at the margins. And so part of my job was to ask, well, if Black women weren't at Seneca Falls, where were they? And what were they doing? And it turns out, very importantly, Black women activists are in their church communities, in particular Black Black. Uh, Methodist women about whom I write, including women like Jarena Lee, are in their church communities making politics, politics about gender and power. And so I think readers are initially surprised that this book begins with a preaching woman, that it begins in a sense in church um, and not in a secular political space. Um, But this is one of the distinct dimensions of how Black women come ultimately to be suffragists at the end of the 19th century is that they have developed a political philosophy. That philosophy, we come to label intersectionality. They have a critique of the intersection of racism and sexism um, and how uh, how that burdens their public lives. Um, They are building um, ways of organizing with one another. Um, They are learning to make politics with men. Um, And they are bringing all those lessons to the story we know better at the end of the 19th century, which is the birth of the Black women's club movement, that very forthrightly political, suffrage-oriented, secular organization. But I don't think you can understand that if you don't understand the long lessons that come from preaching women and lay women alike who are organizing in these institutions. And it's funny, isn't it? Because by the time we get to the modern civil rights era, we regard it as axiomatic, right? That the church was an important place, um, but that was hardly new during the modern civil rights era. That had always been the ways in which black women had worked politically, it turns out. Yeah, I love that idea of, you know, if they were not in Seneca Falls, where are they? And mm-hmm. I'm going to look at that. Um, and, you know, um, of course, we we rest on the shoulders of, you know, our foremothers, right? Uh, scholars who, who wrote about Black women in the suffrage movement, scholars like uh, Rosalind Turbo Penn, uh, scholars like Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, who looks at Black women's activism within the church, particularly the Afro-Baptist Church, uh, and Deborah Gray White, who, who looked at, you know, the club movement besides her work on uh, Black women in slavery. And what I really liked about Vanguard is the attention that you pay to Black women's work in the club movement and in the churches. You know, if they are being sidelined in the suffrage movement because of this um, Southern strategy that is being adopted uh, by um, by some suffragists, uh, they don't let that deter them. They they go ahead and do the work in the spaces that are open to them. And I want you to talk more about 
uh, that that work? Um, you know, what is the kind of work that that goes that unleashes emancipatory possibilities for all women and for all Black people? And uh, their work in the club movement. You know, here we are in Massachusetts. So one of my favorite people, of course, is Josephine St. Pierre Rafford and, um, you know, her club in, in Boston and her visualization of how this could be a national movement. So tell us more about that. You know, as I begin to spend more time with some of these women who um, ultimately give us um the club movement, including Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, um, but Eliza Ann Gardner, who comes out of um, the Amy Zion Church and finally into the founding of the club movement. Um, I really needed to find their words, read their words, and take them seriously as thinkers, as analysts, as political theorists of a sort, because they are daring to do something that is never been done and that very few Amer Americans can imagine even for them, which is to become fully fledged political. Um, I didn't understand, I didn't understand those words at first. Um, one was dignity, right? Not equality, yes, equality, but not only equality, dignity. Um, and the other um, is, uh, Humanity, humanity. And I had to spend a lot of time with those terms because these are not terms that were familiar to me from the work we had on the white-led suffrage organization. So what are black women doing when they create the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, for example? Well, they are telling us that there is a problem and the problem is not simply one of equality. It is one of dignity or indignity in their lives. And the way I like to explain this or, or illustrate this is to say what black women have experienced is that long before they get to the suffrage association convention, they have experienced Jane Crow, the violence of seg segregation in transportation, and their white, the white women, their white women counterparts have watched, have watched that happen to them, and have nonetheless deigned that to be outside the parameters of what suffrage associations should be charged with challenging. So black women think, you know, no, we are going to create an organization that will speak to our dignity. Right. Um, and not only our equality. And the second is humanity. Um, and here we learn that Black women really throughout, but certainly by the 1860s, when you have women like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, um, the poet, um, anti-slavery lecturer, but suffragists beginning to speak to these questions, these are women who are looking to set the bar high for all of us, not simply for themselves. Um, they see a deep flaw in American democracy and they believe, I think not incorrectly, right, that any nation that will permit them to rise will in the process overcome, right, overcome a, 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 a broad, right, a broad swath of the inequality that is plaguing the nation. So they are really progenitors of a human rights vision, um, of, of which their examples and their experience fuels, um, but it is not, that is not the end game for them. That is just the beginning place in their work in the club movement. 
Yes, and uh, I have so many questions for you, Martha. But unfortunately, our time is up, and I can see Scott is 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 back here. But but you are right. You know, just to reiterate what you said in terms of uh, how Black women see a much broader emancipatory project than than some of the white suffragists do. Ida B. Wells, who's I think our mutual favorite, mm-hmm. her attempt, her anti lynching campaign and her attempt to actually make suffragists so even the women's christian temperance union uh pay attention to this plague uh afflicting the united states and how they do not see it as a women's question when black women like wells do and the club women you know, the club women do. So wonderful. So yeah, I will stop there. And uh, yeah, I, I had I had three more questions, Scott, but our time is not our time is not it's not our time is not up, Manisha. We have questions from our audience. And so I wanted to wonderful. offer Opportun- yeah. opportunity opportunity to, to uh bring in our audience. But before I do, I, I just want to say thank you, Manisha, and thank you, Martha, for this amazing conversation. Um, and now I'm happy to um introduce some of the questions from our, our listeners tonight, our viewers. Uh Jeremy Lutton asks, what were the major elements of the Black women's movement after 1965? Or is the part of the movement considered over? Um, well, thank you for that, because of course it is not um that. Um, particularly in the American South, um, local officials do not acquiesce or roll over or step aside in the face of um, the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act by federal officials. Um, And so the next chapter is in part um, about extraordinary courageous women um, who are now going to be the front line of breathing meaning, live meaning, into the Voting Rights Act. And as we know, that story has continued with many chapters that I know we don't have time to delve into tonight. Um, There is that. But there is, of course, also um, now um, extraordinary Black women who are going to step fully right into the body politic. Um, uh, Historian Anastasia Kerwood has a new biography just out on the great uh, Shirley Chisholm. Um, You know, Chisholm, uh, elected to Congress, local office in the early 60s, to Congress in 1968, runs for president in 1972. And there's lots to say about that. But for our purposes, just to say, Chisholm doesn't think she's going to win the Democratic nomination exactly in 1972. But what she's going to do is ignite that newly empowered Black electorate like it's never been ignited before by way of her national campaign for the Democratic nomination. Um, So breathing life into a Voting Rights Act requires um, women's activism, commitment, and courage. Yeah. And I would quickly add to that, Scott, uh, that I would put in a plug for another new book um, on uh, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, who's, you know, that iconic photograph of hers with Gloria Steinem, who raised a host of issues that affect all women uh, in the new feminist movement, the modern feminist movement. And Laura Lovett has a wonderful new biography of hers. But I think as Martha wonderfully shows in her book, even after 1965, I mean, the vote, the Black vote remains contested, right? So it's not as if everything gets solved. And I think what was really interesting about the book was the way in which you trace modern activism by Black women, Martha, uh, in trying to continually secure that vote. So not to see the vote as simply an achievement that is, you know, done as we all know today, it remains contested. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew Robertson asks, can you tell us about how the women's vote was sold to Northern racist men, fearful of Southern European immigration and also Southern racist men who were fearful of an upsurge of the black vote. Women would ostensibly be the reserve army in quotes of voters for white supremacy in the South and WASP ascendancy in the North. Yeah. One of the things, um, Andrew, that I hadn't seen for myself until I started reading the congressional record um, from the, in the debates around what becomes the 19th amendment um, was how openly those debates turn on the assumption 
that nothing will permit black women to vote in those states that um, are set on suppressing the black vote, that this is an open facet um, that suffragists trade in, um, that lawmakers extol on the, the floors of Congress, um, and that are at the heart of ratification of the amendment in the American South. Now, there's a story I tell in this book about how in the years leading up to the 19th amendment, um, part of what's going on is a campaign to repeal the 15th amendment. Um, that's how deeply held, right? The anti-black vote um, sentiment remains in the 19 teens. Um, and there are Southern lawmakers who look to horse trade uh, around the 19th amendment and basically say, We'll, we'll endorse the 19th Amendment if you put the white, word white in it. We'll endorse the 19th Amendment if it has a clause that makes clear that individual states will retain their right to otherwise control all aspects of voting rights. Um, so this is not a secret in 1920. This is essential in 1920, just as Andrew suggests, right, to getting to goal and to get men male lawmakers on board. They believe that white women will vote like their husbands. Some, sometimes correct, sometimes not, right? So they're, 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 they've got a truncated view of even white women's political power, but they're clear that black women will vote as a block and will empower the Republican party. Um, and Democrats are not gonna permit that to happen. And they don't, right? they don't. Yeah. And to, to reiterate what, what Martha is saying a bit, Yes, in the North, they also use literacy tests, et cetera, against immigrant working class people. Um, but it was nothing compared to the kind of systematic disfranchisement that you have in the South. That was in a league of its own. And what one of the things that I really enjoyed reading in Martha's book was uh, this racist demagogue, right, from Mississippi, James Vardaman. He's the guy who's trying to get the word white inserted into the 19th Amendment, and he fails, uh, as, as, as Martha points out. And before that, my impression was that Southerners were just against the idea of a co constitutional amendment or any kind of federal standard for voting, because they, it immediately conjured for them reconstruction. And that was what they had overthrown and they wanted the status quo to remain. But as Martha shows in her book, when they realize that the 19th Amendment is going to pass, they try to insert the word white and they fail. And I think that was one of the nice parts of the book that shows how this kind of racism, this kind of crude racism that people like Vardaman and Tillman are advocating in Congress is somewhat defeated. And, and, and part of it, I think, has to do with the kind of work that African-American women and others are doing in the trenches. You know, I mean, Vardaman um, comes to the Senate uh, and that's his platform. Black disenfranchise is his platform. He comes to do in Congress what has already been done in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, and those debates are, I think, um, arresting um, because not only because of Bartimaeus sentiment, but because it lets us know everyone understands the, the terms of, of what is being arrived at. Um, and, and I would say for me, you know, the disappointment of the 19th Amendment is that it doesn't take on language and terms, right, to confront what is going to happen, right, right at the, you know, right at the base um, in local jurisdictions after 1920. I mean, you're right, because they simply adopt the language of the 15th Amendment after knowing how Southern states had gotten <laughs> around that language, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, D. Andrews simply writes in the Q&A, thank you so much for a revelatory talk. Wonderful. And I think um, she speaks on behalf of certainly of me and of many others in our audience tonight. I think, uh, Martha, one of the things you said at the, at the very beginning um, is that what you're doing in this book is confronting myths with, with good history. And I think 
That's exactly what, what both, both of our guests tonight, Manisha Sinha and Martha Jones do in their scholarship. They confront all kinds of myths of the American past with deeply researched and beautifully written good history. And that's what we, we aim to, to spotlight here. And so uh, I wanna say thank you to both of you for this conversation. Um, I also want to thank our partners at the Worcester Black History Project, uh, which is a co-sponsor of our event this, this evening. Uh, for those of you who are here in Worcester or in central Massachusetts, I wanna call your attention to an exhibition that the Worcester Black History Project is, is sponsoring uh, this week and next week of uh, the Black Doll Project from the Black Doll Museum. Um, for those of you who are here in Worcester, that exhibition is at the JMAC, the Jean McDonough Arts Center, uh, through February 10th. There's an opening reception and various other events and activities this Saturday. So I encourage you to check out that exhibition. I also want to encourage all of our, our viewers tonight to come back in three weeks, three weeks from tonight, when we have our next virtual program. Tara Bynum will be here to talk about her new book, Reading Pleasures, Everyday Black Living in Early America, which just appeared in the last couple of months. That's Thursday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. We also have a full slate of programs for March and beyond. Please check the AAS website. And if you'd like to recommend tonight's program to friends, all of our public programs are available on the AAS YouTube channel, as this one will be quite soon. Um, Martha Jones, Manisha Sinha, thank you so much for, for this conversation this evening. And, and thanks to all of our viewers and have a good evening.